So welcome to our session. I'm going to introduce both of our speakers. So I'm so excited to have Dr. Matt Tidwell here. He is our Assistant Dean for Graduate and Professional Studies uh, with the Journalism School. So he wonderfully offered to come and show some things to us today. And then also Dr. Janelle Belmis, and she's an Associate Professor of Journalism School and also a, a knitter, as am I. So. <laughs> Um, I'm excited to have both of, of my colleagues in here presenting to you. We're going to start with Dr. Tidwell, and he is going to take over and talk to us about VoiceThread. Okay. Thank you, Heather. I appreciate it. And in just a second, I'll be sharing screen here. So I think you told me you were going to make me co-host to allow me to do yes, that. Yes, you so, are ready to but, go. Uh, good to see everybody. Good to see a good crowd. And uh, yeah, this is a, a, a tool that... Uh, I'm actually quite passionate, I guess as passionate as one can get about a, an ed tech tool, but uh, voice thread I'd be extremely useful. So let's get right to it uh, in the interest of time. And I'm gonna share my screen here. So I've got just a few slides, not gonna overwhelm you. With the 432nd PowerPoint you've seen this month, but uh, there is some information I think that's helpful. So it says that I am sharing screen now. So uh, feel free to pop on if you're not seeing that, but it looks like I am, I'm gonna switch to slideshow. So, um, so VoiceThread. So this is a tool that's around for a while now, uh, and it's been available through KU for, oh my gosh, I started adjuncting at the university probably nine or 10 years ago, and VoiceThread was around. Um, but as you'll see, I, 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 I've uh, titled the, my talk on VoiceThread, it's a, it's a tool to easily make online hybrid classes more efficient. Um, now, you can also use it in in-person classes, and I, I have done so many times, but today, particularly with the situation we're in in the world today, I'm going to confine basically to those of us who are working in the online hybrid environment, which is sort of everybody now, right? So, uh, and Heather already introduced me. Just a, a bit more about my background. I spent a long time in, in industry and marketing communications, which is what I teach in, before I came over and, and got my PhD about uh, three years ago, and now I'm in academia full time. Uh, so, a little bit more then. Let's get right into it with VoiceThread. Um, so, the image on the right, I think, it describes how a lot of us are feeling these days. It's a tightrope walk, right? Um, to try to get our, um, get our content to the point where we feel comfortable presenting it. If you're like me and enjoy presenting in a classroom and sort of an extroverted personality as, as I am, uh, you're really, you're, you're sort of craving that, right? You're craving that, that ability to be able to interact as close to real time as possible and to let students, you know, get a feel for you and your presentation style and what you bring to the class. And I think VoiceThread helps us to do that. So I would describe VoiceThread as a very easy way to mimic as closely as possible, how I might present, say, a set of slides in the live classroom, or it could be uh, a PDF or a Microsoft Word document, or you, there are many different types of media, just meaning different kinds of, of platforms that you can use within VoiceThread, and so we'll talk about those today, but I'll pretty much confine it to slides just because that's sort of the normal uh, lecture environment, and VoiceThread has a lot of capability. My goal today, I should say this off the top, is just to give you kind of a base level understanding of it, and even to get you to the point where you could go on today to your VoiceThread KU account and, and take it for a test drive and, and try to uh, upload some comments and, and, and play around with it a little bit, and I do, I do uh, recommend that. It's a very hands-on program. It's very intuitive. It's very easy to use, uh, but um, there's no substitute for sort of practicing on your own. Some of the features, so it's going to give you the ability to upload your slides in an easy kind of drag and drop manner, or you can simply go to the typical upload function as you would see in any program to bring in slides from another drive or even a, 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 a cloud drive or something like that. Uh, PowerPoint slides, Word documents, PDFs, all of those are fair game. Um, and then what it does once you get those uploaded into the program is it gives you the ability to add your comments to the slides via video which is usually the way I do it, so that I'm actually on kind of off in the corner in a little uh, square there talking to the slides as they roll through. But you can also record your comments on audio or even just with text uh, kind of running along the bottom. So it gives you different methods to be able to record um, your comments on the slide material. Uh, and it, it, the, one of the things I really like is it's very easy to share. So once you've recorded, say, a 12-slide lecture, 20, 30 minutes, you're able to then record that uh, obviously, and then it gets uploaded to your, the, the VoiceThread cloud, and then you have the ability to very easily share it uh, simply with a link, uh, which is usually the way I do it. There are some other ways to share it, uh, but it allows you to generate 
a link that is open that can be opened really on any kind of a, a web browser. And as Heather mentioned, uh, particularly when we get into the the live demo here in a second, um, we'll all have time at the at the end to answer questions if you have any. Um, certainly. So, um, from a student perspective, it also as you're you've recorded your content, but it also allows students to add comments or questions as they view your recorded presentation. And I think this is a very important part, right? We want it to be two-way communication, not just one-way communication. And when students can upload comments, uh, either via video or just in text, then you're able to see what their questions are about what you've just talked to them about, right? Your lecture content. So in that sense, it almost feels like a synchronous tool, even though it's asynchronous, um, even though uh, students can, you can send them a link and they can look at it really kind of at their leisure or whenever you give them a deadline to view it, et cetera. Um, second bullet there, you can also turn the tool over to students and allow them to record their own presentations. And I've actually done this in a couple of classes. Um, and I know we've got some other professors, I know Professor Hendershot's done this a couple of times at the journalism school where um, students can then use the VoiceThread program to maybe record their own slide deck, let's say, or um, you've given them maybe a final project. Uh, and once they've recorded and sent you their link, you can then comment, right, right on the recording. I really liked how you talked about this concept or whatever it might be. Um, and I usually do that via text, but I think you could actually even come up via your own video as well, although I'm not taking it to that level. Uh, but there is this interplay back and forth where the student can drive in terms of creating their own. Um, and then the other thing I like is that everybody, it's free. Uh, and how many times do we have that as an option? Um, everyone at KU has their own account, their own login, their own storage, et cetera. And I'll show you uh, in a couple of minutes how to, uh, how to access that. So how have I used the program before we look at it? Uh, in a few ways. Um, one of the ways that I like it is that it, it allows me to cover basic materials that I don't want to waste precious in-class time for, right? So I teach at the graduate level. I usually teach in night school classes or two and a half or so hours long. That's precious time for me, even when we're in a normal environment. And if I've got simple concepts or definitions or maybe some research that I want people to understand at a base level, I don't want to spend it, burn a lot of time in class for that. So if I can put it on VoiceThread and record it, then I can, I can assign the students to do that out of class so that when we're in class, we can spend more time on particularly at the graduate level. It's all about rich discussion, right? I want to be able to have that, that rich discussion with them without having to cover uh, some basic research that they should already know. That's why I would put that on a VoiceThread. Um, other big use is during the pandemic. Uh, it's really a perfect tool for this hybrid environment so that, um, you know, I don't know about you all, but as I teach online classes, if I do them synchronously, say in a Zoom session, uh, I happen to believe that Zoom fatigue is a real thing. Uh, and I think that to the degree that I can limit the time uh, it, that we're together uh, synchronously on Zoom, that's probably good. Uh, and so what I will do is I'll, I'll often do maybe an hour and a half uh, synchronous Zoom session, but then I'll put another half hour or an hour's worth of content on VoiceThread. And then that becomes the content for that week, if you will. So in the pandemic, it's really this ability to record material is kind of a perfect tool for the perfect time or the right time. Um, the other thing I've used it for is anything I want to record and deliver to the same class every year or every semester. Uh, a good example is case study. Um, so I teach crisis communications and in crisis communications, when I was in the industry, I had a lot of opportunity to work crisis. And so I developed case studies and things like that. What I will do, um, you know, once every two or three years is I'll go into VoiceThread and I'll record a couple of those case studies so that I can create sort of a recorded library of the, study, the case study. And then I can use that every single class, right? So it actually makes my time as an instructor more efficient in that I don't have to dig out the slides again, remind myself of what I want to say. I actually record it um, and I have them watch it uh, at home or at their leisure. And then uh, if we want to do discussion, then many times I'll do that uh, when we all get back together synchronously, whether that be in the classroom or via Zoom or what have you. Um, and then lastly, it's to allow students to uh, make presentations virtually by recording them, as I might kind of alluded to this a few minutes ago. And, and where I've done this, uh, I think, most successfully is in the area of final projects. Um, so a lot of times I will have students do final projects that might, uh, from a presentation perspective, take 15 or 20 minutes individually. Well, again, that's going to burn a lot of time, right, that we may not have in the classroom if, we're, if we are in fact physically in the classroom. So by them uh, doing the recordings on VoiceThread, um, first of all, I can grade those based off their recording, and I can even share them with the rest of the class. Where I've even done where some students will present in person, others will do VoiceThread uh, or even give them the option. 
you can mix and match however however you care to. So lots of great uses for the program. What I'd like to do now is kind of give you a, uh, let's, let's just take a little test drive here and we're gonna be somewhat limited by the technology in that you can't use your webcam for two programs simultaneously. So there'll be a little bit of a limit to what I can show you, but just give me a couple of tech moments here. And I just kind of want to walk you through the paces of how you would go about um, logging on to VoiceThread and then uh, actually uh, uh, playing around with video recording. So uh, I'm going to stop my share here and I'm going to go back out and grab, make sure I've got the right folders up, I do. Okay, so now I can go back to share screen. Yep, that's ready to go. Always a little bit of a tech moment there. Okay. There we go. Okay, and then I'm also going to oops, take you to a browser window first. That's probably a better place to start. So Let's go out to just say a normal browser window off your Chrome or, or your Safari or whatever you're using. And this would be how you would, this is a shortcut to log in to the KU VoiceThread system is you're just gonna go VoiceThread and it's automatically populated it for me as you can see. But the, the address is voicethread.ku.edu, voicethread.ku.edu. Uh, and when you enter, it's going to take you into the KUIT system. And you'll notice there's some description here. Uh, this is what everybody would see when they follow that thread. Uh, there, by the way, there are, IT has done some uh, additional tutorials and I highly recommend those. I'm gonna give you a base level understanding of the program, but if by looking at some of the tutorial information here, you're gonna get even better feel. But the key, uh, the key here is this, uh, this button over the, on, the, on the middle of the right-hand column here where it says voice thread login. So when you click that, um, it's going to ask you to sign in through KU. So yes, I want to do that. That is my username. It should be my right password. Let's see here. Uh, and I'm going to enter. Oops. All right, great. So it's now taking me into VoiceThread. So I'm now in the program. And this is what a typical opening page looks like. This would be sort of like your voice, well, it is your VoiceThread homepage, as you'll see up here in the upper left. And what it does, it does a couple of things. It defaults to opening a whatever voice threads you have recorded in the past. So as you can see, I've done a lot of them. Uh, because, in fact, that's a case study right there. Uh, and or that one's a case study, that one's a student project. So I have all kinds of, of uh, old archive, it archives everything for you up into the cloud, right? So, uh, and so this is just your normal homepage where when you've finished a voice thread, um, it's gonna park it here for you. And then I'll show you in a little bit, in, in a little bit how that you can go back and manipulate those recordings and send them out and things like that. Um, but what I wanna do now is I wanna go to this uh, create button because I wanna create a new voice thread. So again, very intuitive, the one up here in the upper left with the little pencil. So I'm gonna to go to create and it's gonna ask me to add media. It's simply saying, what are the fi what's, which file do you wanna bring into VoiceThread to then comment and, and use your video on? So uh, I'm gonna click add media, which is gonna bring up a series of options here. Um, instead of bringing anything in, I'm just gonna go straight to my computer because I know that I had a, um, I had a file ready to go. So I'm gonna call this uh, demo lecture slides, right? So uh, pretend like this would be a normal lecture slide that I'm giving say for the summer class that I just finished. So I'm going to go grab it and I'm going to hit open to bring it into the book. Let me find my mouse is being squirrely on me here. So just do enter. Uh, okay, oops, there we go. All right, it's gonna open. Now it's gonna ask me to give it a title within VoiceThread. So I'll call this Demo Summer Lecture. And also I'd like to give it a date just because if you do one of these, uh, you know how that goes. So we'll just do a fictitious date here, uh, June 20th of 20, okay? And then I'm gonna save. So now you'll see there's a little gear shift here. What it's doing is it's going out, VoiceThread is going into my computer and pulling those six or seven lecture slides in. And oh, look at that, there they are. So it's now pulled my slide material into the program. So now I'm, I've, I've, I've added the media, I've added the slides, as you can see there. Now I wanna comment, right? So it's step one, step two, step three. And comment in VoiceThread simply means how are you going to now make your comments on this material? So uh, I'm going to click the comment. 
And the first thing it's going to do is it's going to load my first slide. So you're now seeing an image of the very first slide in this demo lecture. There's the date. I can double check that, that it is the correct material. And then uh, the, the very important button, this button down here at the bottom is the plus sign. And what that means is, and you can see it's in a little comment bubble. It means, okay, now you're ready to make your comments. So I'm going to hit the plus sign and it's going to give me options. And this just simply means how do you want to content or comment on these slides? And you could do it via text. It be a telephone. I'm not sure what that is. I've never used it. You could do it, the microphone there, via just an audio recording, or you could use your webcam and pop up in the, on the left side as you're scrolling through your slides. So in my case, uh, I would gonna, I'm going to shrink a little bit here so I can see the whole thing. I'm going to comment via webcam. Now, the problem I'm going to have is it's probably going to give me an error message that says you're already using your webcam. <laughs> yeah, it does. And I don't want to get out of Zoom, so I'm just going to cancel that. But if, if it would have worked for us there, and I, I would have not obviously been doing what I'm doing with you all. Um, it would the light would have uh, come on on my webcam, and I would have given a, been given a little countdown, like a four, three, two, one, and then all of a sudden in the left side, and you'll see this in a second when I show you the finished product. You will see me speaking as I'm scrolling through the sides. So what I would do if the webcam were active is I would welcome everybody with some kind of a welcome message. And notice this uh, in the very far right corner, this uh, arrow button that just allows me to advance to the next slide. So let's say I've done my welcome. Uh, a lot of times for a class, I want to say, here's what we're going to do today. Uh, you know, we're going to check in on the class schedule. We're going to look at some response strategies. We're going to talk about some research, discuss next week's assignment. And oh, by the way, you are able to uh, mark things on the slide as you talk by simply holding down your mouse. And it will give you a little uh, line tool that will allow you to say circle things, things, and it basically annotate the slides. And as you can see here, I took what was a, uh, a full class and distilled it down into five or six slides just for the purpose of this demo. So then when I'm done with my last slide, uh, I am going to, so we talked about next week, you will see like a lot of recordings down here where the play sign is, there would be a stop uh, button. So I would hit the stop button and it would automatically stop and it would automatically begin uh, basically uploading the, the presentation. So if it took five minutes or 20 minutes or 45 minutes, it, as soon as you hit stop, it's going to upload it and send it back to your homepage so that you can then view it on your own. So this is an example of how I would uh, how I would use the program to record, but of course I wasn't able to do that because of the webcam issue. Let's go back out to the, uh, out to the homepage. And I just need to make sure that, so I'm going to go back out here in the upper left to my VoiceThread homepage. I want to show you, I actually, before, uh, yesterday, before uh, I knew I was going to do this session, I actually did go in and record these slides so that you could see what it looks like. So I'm going to go back out here to the homepage. Uh, and this is the one I want to show you, but I'm going to stop my share to make sure that I've got my audio turned on. So, uh, because if you don't, oh, I did not. So let me do that now. Okay, there we go. So now I'm going to share. Okay, so now we're seeing the home page again. So I just click the button that should allow you to hear the audio. Um, if for some reason it doesn't, uh, Heather, please flag me. But so I'm now going to show you. So I've recorded uh, those seven slides, and now I'm going to, uh, they're, they're parked here on my home page, uh, finished version. Uh, and I'm going to hit the play button, and you all should be able to both, and it's only a couple of minutes because I fly through it, see and hear how this would look for, say, a student. So here we go. I'm going to hit play, probably. Nope. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this video lecture uh, today, and uh, welcome to class session number three of Crisis Communications. Let's take a look at what we have today. Thanks for viewing this voice thread. Um, there'll be an opportunity for you can certainly add comments uh, if you want by clicking on the comment tab at the bottom, uh, or you can just save your questions and, and uh, forward them when we get to the next class session. Um, here's what we'll do today. We'll check in on the class plan schedule, which is really easy to do. We're on schedule, so we're good there. Uh, want to look one more time at the response strategies that we mentioned last week. Uh, and then also today talk about what research, which researchers say is the best response uh, strategies. And then we'll end by discussing next week's assignment. Okay, so if you're with me, let's just get right to it. Um, I had you read the content from Coombs last week. And if you recall, he talked about different types of response strategies, primary strategies, deny strategies, and there were several subgroups underneath 
we're using empathy, transparency, expertise, and commitment when we're working with organizations. And so, um, you know, this is an important tool for us to use. And as we've said, we can use this tool actually as we're working a particular crisis. So highly recommend that one. So uh, that's the end of the lecture material for today. Uh, for next week, I'd like for you to read uh, the fifth chapter of the Fern Banks book on social media and crisis communications. Uh, I'll be posting a PDF uh, section from Hoffman on Blackboard. Um, and then uh, you'll have that assignment number two, uh, which, by the way, will not be due until Friday now. So we're uh, we're giving you a couple more days on that one. So uh, that's the that's the the content that I'd like for you to have ready uh, for me when we're together uh, next week and and to prepare for next week. If you have any questions, certainly let me know, or you can place a comment right here on the voice thread if that's important. Uh, and uh, we'll see you down the road. Thanks. Okay, so hopefully you can now hear me and not my recording. Students would add a comment by clicking the plus button, and then their photo would pop up over here uh, with their comment and including their date. So, um, so that's how a student would comment on a voice thread that they're viewing. So that's a that's a, the finished version of uh, of the the class lecture that I wanted to demo. So I'm going to hit the X here in the upper right, go back out to my home page. And there it is, I titled it finished version. So then you would say, okay, well, that's great. So you've recorded, now you, you need to send it out to students, right? Simplest way to do that, again, wanna get you up and running today if possible, is this little button just says share, right? Uh, there are some other buttons there that allow you to edit and things like that. I don't wanna edit, I'm happy with it. I've gone back and looked at it off my homepage. I'm ready to share. I'm gonna click share. It's gonna give me some options here. Uh, you can, and the ones that, you can you can create groups uh, that are individual classes. Um, I've done that a little bit, but frankly, I find the basic share function the easiest. So I'm gonna click on the basic tab because that just gives you a, a, a uh, web-based link that anybody can use. And I just find that's the easiest way to do it. And you can see that it populates the link here. It's ready to go. Uh, and I can copy the link. And then notice that there are check marks here. Uh, that allow anyone to view or comment. Make sure you check those, right? Uh, always as you're going through, make sure everything's checked because what if you don't check those and you try to send out the link, say to students or put, maybe post it to your Blackboard page in the announcements and those aren't checked, they won't be able to view it. You'll get lots of emails saying, oh my gosh, I can't view your recording. What am I gonna do? So uh, save yourself some time and trouble by making sure those are checked. And then once they are and you're happy with that, you know that it's saved. Uh, I always just do a quick copy link. It's copied in my clipboard. Now I can go out, let's say, and put it in VoiceThread or, or, I'm sorry, put it in Blackboard or send it out via, via email, however I wanted to interact with students. I always open a new window just to try to check to make sure that the link works. So I'm going to just paste it there and we should see me, we should see it pop up again. There it is. Oh, it pops up to where it finished. So I would need to move it back to the beginning. And good morning, everyone. Welcome to morning again. So we know that it works now. So, uh, so again, so homepage, but the keys are the create to go out and pull in your content and then, and then start that webcam or start that audio recording, roll through the slides, uh, stop it. It will save it, move it back to your homepage, and then you can share it out. So pretty intuitive, pretty easy to use. Again, IT has some really good tutorials. Um, I can talk to you about, there are some other features with regard to even being able to, while it saves your recording um, to your homepage, um, you're also able to uh, actually download it as like an MP4 file. So you could actually have it as a video file as well. Um, so if you wanted to use it, say for external purposes, I've been asked to speak to a couple of, of groups, uh, say in the Kansas City area of crisis communications, a lot of times I will, uh, I may not have access to my KU system wherever they're gonna have me speak. That's why I might download, say, a presentation to an MP4 uh, file. Um, so let's just go back to the slides. I wanna wrap up here and move to questions in the next couple of minutes to hopefully keep us as on time as possible. So uh, let's see, go back and then I'll be ready for your questions. I just had a little bit more I wanted to cover. Um, so. Should be seeing my slides again. Sorry for jumping around, but that's our life these days. So we just did the test drive. Um, 
So pros and cons. So um, the pros, I think I really already covered. Uh, it's all those things about, you know, just be, being very intuitive and being very simple and easy to use. Really those slides three through five that I, I went through earlier and, and how I've used it uh, and, and, and added things, including, you know, having students produce their own voice threads and things like that. Um, and uh, and so uh, those those are those are the, the pros. There are, I would say, maybe two or three cons. Uh, bandwidth and connectivity needs to be pretty good for this program. Um, and I think the reason for that, and Heather's more of an expert than I am, but it, it heavily uses video, right? So um, if you've done, say, a, you know, the, the one that I recorded for that demo was just like three minutes, it uploaded very quickly. It uploaded within, say, uh, a minute and a half. Um, I've noticed as I start to do voice threads that are much longer in, say, the 45, 55, over a minute range or over an hour range, it can take longer. It can take uh, the wheel is spinning for um, you know, 8, 10, 12, 15 minutes potentially before it finally populates it to my home screen. Um, and I've got pretty good connectivity here in my home office, better on campus, but I, I see that in both places. So bandwidth and connectivity need to be good. Um, it can take a long, so it can take, if the presentation is longer, that's why you need to have a good bandwidth because it can take a long time. Um, and I would say the other kind is just, there is a bit of a learning curve if you decide to use it with your students in that um, you either have to do a tutorial like this with them and burn some class time for that, or you have to go out, and I'm sure there, this does exist with IT, uh, find a good tutorial that they can give you. And then VoiceThread as a company uh, has some pretty good uh, basic, like they, they have one that's almost exactly what I've just shown you, uh, available on uh, on their resource as well uh, that you, I could, you potentially could go out and use that one. In fact, I think that's the one that I used uh, the last time I I, uh, I tried to get students in um, to work with the program. Uh, but I, I had surprisingly uh, little trouble uh, with students. I, I think I had a, a, a class of maybe 25 and I had maybe 15 of those do their presentations via voice thread. And I really only had issues with one or two of those. And they typically had to do with things like very poor connectivity uh, bandwidth wise at, at their home. And so they, they were just, you know, their presentations were 30 minutes long and they just weren't able to, to upload. So, uh, but don't be discouraged by the spinning wheel. If you have a longer, uh, if you have a longer lecture, it, it will get there. It just takes a, a little bit of time. So uh, a few few cons, but mostly pros uh, there. So um, I, I really want to get into your questions. And, and again, hopefully this gave you a chance to get uh, a little bit more familiar with the program and, and be at least to the point where you could go, go in and play around with it. The, the way I started was I uh, took some simple slides um, and recorded my, my own just kind of for my purposes. Uh, went back and, and looked at it, made sure I was comfortable with all of the, you know, with the, the one, two, three process there, uh, and then um, generated a couple links and tried them out on different web browsers and things like that um, so that I could make sure that it worked well. Um, so with that, Heather, I'm going to stop share. Here's my email address if anybody would like to get a hold of me. I'm also on Twitter, uh, but I know we wanted to uh, perhaps open it up to questions, right? Yeah, we had a lot of really good questions in the chat, so I'm going to um, share those first, and then if anyone else has any questions, we can get to those. So first of all, a lot of people very excited, a lot of thanks, we're so excited about this, this is great, so all of that really good stuff. Um, so first question was, can you record over a video? Yes, you can record over a video. Uh, I've done, I haven't done it a lot, I've done it maybe two or three times. Uh, it's fairly intuitive. Um, you, when, when you hit that plus sign at the bottom and it gave you the different ways to comment, video, et cetera, one of the options, was, or I'm sorry, when you uh, went to load in your slides, right? So go grab the media that you want to use. One of the options was uh, web video. And so if you click that, then it will take you out into sort of a YouTube interface, let's say. Okay. And you can, I can't remember, the, I, think it, I think it is just the link is all you need. And then you're set to go. Uh, and you could either, um, you could make that a standalone or you could add it to uh, your PowerPoint uh, information okay. as well, or pack it onto the end or however you want to do that. Okay. Um, do you have an idea of, and I'm getting a comment um, from an attendee who said, They've recorded over video, it puts down two tracks. So you can watch the video by itself, and then there's a comment track. So you see different uh, icons. Yeah, it's, okay, thank you. That I don't know if you can do. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, I certainly have not used it for that purpose. I've used it for, um, let's say I'll have a, a news uh, item I want people to say off of, see off of a crisis. Mm -hmm. So I'll play the two or three minute news clip and then we'll talk about it. Okay. Either I'll comment on it or, or, 
for, for all of it. Okay. Um, another question about storage space. You said you've been using this for quite a while. Um, okay, on storage space, or do you have an idea of how much storage space is available? Don't know specifically. IT can answer that question for you. I can tell you that I've had lectures on there, if you would have scrolled down on my homepage, that are uh, five, six years old. And the other thing that I don't know, which would be a good question, another IT question, um, is that I don't know whether if it's like, you know how our Zoom recordings are actually saved to Media Hub. Um, I, I don't know whether that interface exists for, uh, for VoiceThread. Um, but again, it, let's say it was one of those case studies that you want to present every single year. I think that would be, that'd be great if it could be, uh, if it could be saved to media, Hub, because I know media Hub theoretically lasts forever. At least that's what I've been told. Uh, so I would, I would try to get it in media. The other option that you could have is to, if it's a really important thing, like a case study that you want to come back to year after year, uh, download it, it send it to your homepage, but then also download it as an MP4 file. Uh, and then that way you've got that, uh, the, you can save it on your own hard drive or in your own cloud or whatever. Okay. Um, have you used Kaltura and could you compare Kaltura to VoiceThread? I've not used Kaltura, no. I got so excited and enamored with VoiceThread that I, I really have not, uh, I've not used uh, Kaltura. Uh, I know there are some similarities. I've talked to people that have used it. Um, but when I saw this gives you the ability to immediately generate a link uh, I was sold. So uh, okay. because for graduate students, I work with a lot of working professionals in my program. They're already working 60 hour weeks. Uh, if I have to try to get them to fish around for stuff or, or upload or whatever, it just, it's the, the link is, is, a, is a savior there. Okay. Um, is there a way to, when you're recording your voice over on the PowerPoint slides, is there a way to create captions automatically for accessibility? Oh, I see. Um, uh, good question. Um, I believe VoiceThread has added captioning, um, but not exactly sure where you would go to access that. Okay. So that, yeah, so that would need to be, again, sorry, but that would need to be an IT question. Okay. And uh -huh. IT support on this, by the way, has been very good. Every time I've had a question, any anytime the university's paying a lot of money for these programs, um, they're going to support them. And this is one, unlike some of the others, where where they, you know, everybody gets an account. So I've never had to wait more than half a day to get an answer back on a question uh, with regard to something I wanted to add. Okay. Can you go back and edit your voice threads? Or that's kind of question one. And part two of that is, can you have videos on or off during the recording? So it may be like, one slide, my video is on, the next one, it's off. Oh, um, I've never tried that. Um, I think you have to, you have to self-identify how you're going to comment at the beginning. And then you would either have to, um, you would either have to record a second. I, I sometimes I've done, the only thing I've done that's similar to that is I've done kind of a part one or a part two, where my part one will be my lecture content that I want to be visible on. And part two, maybe maybe it's because I'm, I'm going through a Word document or something like that, and I want them to really concentrate on what's on the screen. I'll do a part two. So I have done that, but I don't think you can go back and forth in terms of means of, of commenting as the instructor. Uh, I think you have to, to say, am I going to do this via audio microphone? Am I going to do it by my webcam? And then you have to, you have to make that decision uh, at the beginning. And then what was the first part of the question, Heather? Can you go back and edit? Voice yes. threads that you've created. You can go back to edit. So that that uh, when I got to the home page there, and there were those three icons, I picked on the middle one to share it. The one to the left was edit, and if you click that, it will bring it back up for you. Um, and then it has some rudimentary edit tools there, uh, that, like we've seen in other programs that allow you to, um, you know, go back, clip out a portion. Uh, basically, what I've used it for in the past is particularly on the kind of like the zoom on the beginning or the end if there's superfluous information. Uh, but I usually, I try to, when I click the webcam, um, I, I try to be ready to go, right? I, I don't want to, I, I, it's, um, I look at it as if I'm stepping up to the podium in the class. Mm -hmm. uh, I really don't treat it any differently than that. Um, and so in that I've, I've edited maybe twice in, in all the times I've used VoiceThread. I just, um, I've got my, I know what my content material is. I know how I want to run the lecture and I run it through straight to finish and then, uh, and then go from there. Okay. Um, the next few questions are about student comments. So uh, you had talked about recording some like case studies to reuse again. If students comment on those, are those permanent going forward or can those be removed? Yeah, they can be removed. 
uh, by the instructor. So the, the students can comment on the case study that you're giving the first year you give it. And then I see what you're saying, go back to the second year, I wanna get rid of these comments. Yes, you, you, you definitely are, are able to do that. You've got that ability as the, as the okay. owner of the, of the content, if you will. Um, so. And are, um, are the student comments, are they for the whole class to view or just the teacher, just the instructor? Uh, whole class. So you're, that's why when you hit allow anyone to comment, it literally means anyone can comment so that it can be seen. Okay. So, um, like a comment tool in that regard. When you're creating that voice thread link, does it start automatically where you stop or do you need to go back to the very beginning and then generate that link so that when the student brings it up, they don't have to back it up to the start? Should start at the beginning. I noticed that one didn't, and I think it's because I, I, I was I was hoping, I was making sure we weren't going to run out of time. I actually tacked a little comment on the end, and I think it was trying to go to that content as if that was going to be the next thing. But if I was just kind of trying to do that for demo purposes, but it's pretty easy. I just decided I didn't need to do it. And I just never, I never deleted it. So I thought that's where I wanted to start. If you just go straight through, it's going to start at the very beginning. Okay. And um, in that online storage, you can delete old files or things that aren't correct and yep, yep. absolutely you can delete or you can also from the home page you can also download to mp4 okay. uh, in addition to generating the link editing and then download uh, as well okay um and so kind of wrapping up because i'm trying to be aware of time too um <laughs> we have a user who would like to capture audio from the computer as they are um picking up music playing on the computer. So my thought was they probably need to get that music recording to upload and then do the voiceover. Yeah, yeah I would think so too. Again, gets us a, a bit beyond the basic proficiency level. Uh, but yeah, un undoubtedly, uh, you know, if, if they allow you to add, you know, full scale video, uh, I got to believe that music would be would be available as well. But yeah, you're going you're gonna to need some, some better okay. uh, expertise on that. <laughs> exactly. And there are a couple of more questions. I think there's a question about um, demoing, deletion, and sharing. I'm going to see if we have some room at the end in case we want to come back to, to you doing another okay. screen share. But since we're sure. about 45 minutes in, I want to yeah. go ahead and get to Janelle's uh, segment of part of the show. And so thank you guys for all of the great questions. We'll see if we have time at the end to add some more in. Um, but I will turn over the stage to uh, Dr. Belmas um, and, and let her tell you all about Camtasia. Camtasia. Uh, I'm Janelle Belmas. I teach the best stuff ever. I get to teach media law at the J School. Um, and the recording that I provided for you is was kindly created with Heather as I was trying to teach her um, the, one of the most interesting cases, which is not a free speech case, but it's a, a case called Marbury versus Madison. I think there may be some law school uh, folks in here. So I intentionally built in errors. I don't not know the case. So if you're looking at that going, ah, she's wrong on that. You're right, because the intention was to build some things in that I was going to let people edit out. So I'm also going to be bouncing back and forth and sharing my screen. Uh, Matt did a great job on this. I'm really glad he did because he... Um, uh, preface some of the things that are similar actually between uh, Camtasia and, um, excuse me, Camtasia and uh, VoiceThread. So I believe I am sharing my screen now. I'm glancing over. So Sentinel is me too on here. I keep a backup so I can watch the chat and see what other people are seeing. So um, Sentinel is telling me that I am sharing my screen. Um, and again, please feel free to, to drop Heather and it will be I'll do the best I can to answer this. I've been using Camtasia since I started teaching online, which was about 2007 or eight. Uh, so right now we're at Camtasia 2020, which seems to be the way folks are labeling their apps now is uh, by, by year. Um, so what is it? Well, it's an app that creates, edits, renders, and posts videos. Uh, it allows an awful lot of editing things, many more, I believe, than that are available on VoiceThread, although it does take a higher learning curve. I feel like with Matt's introduction, I could just jump right in and, and do the thing, which is very cool. But this is a little bit um, more, a little bit higher of a learning curve, but gives you some opportunities that I suspect VoiceThread doesn't. They're, I think, both really uh, important for 
depending on the application you've got. So it is similar if you are an Adobe fan to Premiere Rush. I'll talk about, I'll show the screens. I'm not going to talk about all the pluses and minuses. I don't teach either of these is in a class, but I do see that there are some similarities between Camtasia and Rush. And I know that at least for some of us, we get Adobe for very cheap and uh, Camtasia is not free, unfortunately. You do have to get an account for it. Um, Mac and PC and can also record iOS device screens uh, available. I am using a PC, but I've shown you a couple of Mac um, shortcuts in case you want to use those. And it does require, um, um, a fee. So it's $169 for educational costs, but your unit um, ha may have some free accounts, some accounts that are floating around. And I know that at least at the J school, you can ask for one of the accounts. I've bought mine because I've been using it like forever. Um, and I have found it to be a, a really good uh, tool. But again, if you don't want to spend that kind of money, you can use some of these same tips and tricks within Adobe Rush, which I believe that the entire university gets for cheaper but you can download it and give it a try for free. I've also given you a handout that I, on the, uh, the link that Heather provided, and that's a PDF that has essentially the same information I'm gonna be use, talking about today, um, or talking about in this little presentation, uh, linked and, and summarized for you. Although as Heather said, I will also share these slides. So why do we care? Can't I just use the results of a Zoom recording? You absolutely can. Okay, absolutely can. And in fact, you know, the one take, I've gotten a little more anal as I've gone on. I, I have trouble now doing one take. I really want to, as, as even as we're talking here, I'm thinking, God, I wish I could re-say that just because I could say it better. But in Camtasia, you can take out your ums and ahs and uhs and oops and all that stuff. You should leave some in, at least the research, and I just attended an online teaching conference a couple weeks ago. Uh, it was suggested that you leave some of those in because it makes you more approachable and more human and less a talking head on the screen. And you can also add in cool things that you can't really with Zoom. You can add in quizzes. You can add in links and hotspots. You can add in closed captioning. And you can add in other stuff that we'll talk briefly about. Okay, so... Zoom is important or anything that gives you an MP4 file can be used within Camtasia, all right? Let me show you quickly about the differences between just a quick screenshot of Camtasia versus Rush. You can see that there's uh, sort of a media center here, same thing. Here's a workspace, it's called Canvas in um, Camtasia. I'm not sure what it's called here in Rush. There's a kind of a workspace over here that I have its properties. Having used both of them, their tracks at the bottom, there's, some, again, some very distinct similarities between the two. I suspect you can take some of these same ideas and do them in Rush uh, that you can in Camtasia. So it's not like you can't use, um, you can't transfer this knowledge, even if you decide not to go with the, the more expensive alternative. So there are five basic steps to making something, uh, making a video in Camtasia for sharing. Uh, unlike VoiceThread, this is information out. Uh, you can do some other steps on your website or have some other ways if you want to do comments, but it's not built in like it is in VoiceThread. They're fairly straightforward. You record, you import, you edit, you produce, and then you publish. Okay. And I'll go through each of those uh, fairly quickly between the two. I'll exp I think what I'll do is I'll explain them first, and then we'll go in and I'll show you on the file that I created uh, with my discussion with Heather on that sexy case. We'll talk about um, how you can use some of these things. Okay, so recording can be any application or any uh, form of content that pro produces an MP4 file or an MP3 file even with, um, with images. So the difference for those of you who are not, and I am no, this is not my content area, so I am making it up as I go along. An MP4 is video plus audio, an MP3 is audio only, which we know from our MP3 players. An M4V is uh, Apple's proprietary um, format, which is very similar to MP4. There are also WAVs, there are AVIs, there are MOVs. I tend to stick with MP4s, and what's nice about the MP4 format is that Zoom will dump that out. So when Heather saves, uh, this uh, presentation so that she can edit it and put it up to YouTube. Uh, Zoom will save an MP4 file. It'll also save the chat. It'll save a um, uh, 
separate uh, MP3 file of just the audio. And all of that is saveable to your computer. And I am kind of anal about wanting to keep recordings. I've got recordings kept back from when I started teaching this in 2008. So I don't trust Zoom. Uh, I download. I want my raw files and I want them on my computer. As a result, I have to have big hard drive space or big Dropbox space, both of which I have. All right, we'll talk about how else to use Dropbox that I think is uh, similar um, or easier in some respects than uh, saving it as uh, websites or as other sorts of files. So um, a couple of, of tricks that I picked up just recently. Um, your screen is supposed to be at eye level, so you're not looking down at the students. Um, I just learned this. I realized as I was doing these things that I was looking down you know, letting them look up my nose, and that's not very pretty. So I now have my laptop that I'm working on elevated on a little, um, on a couple of books. I'm going to get something that's a little more stable, because right now it's kind of rocky, um, but I'm going to try to get something that's a little more stable so that I'm looking at the screen as opposed to looking down at the students. A couple of other things, lightings and backgrounds. You can see my very messy office behind me. Um, I don't mind that. I think that's okay. Uh, but there are some people who have talked about, you know, moving. We we joked about a scavenger hunt uh, in the, uh, I have a baby Yoda that I might start moving around. You can probably see him in the back right there. I may start moving him around a little bit just as kind of a fun scavenger hunt thing. Um, one of the things that, yes, and I am not, again, I am not a lighting expert by any means. All I know is that you can be blared on by windows behind you. Even though it's nice, I have a window in front of me, uh, which you can sort of see reflected in my glasses. And that actually is okay light. I don't have anything like a hair light or anything else going on with that. But I know that there are people who are going to be talking about this kind of presentation stuff tomorrow. Um, chunk, chunk, chunk. In other words, think about paragraphs uh, or sentences rather than paragraphs, rather than books, rather than chapters than books. Uh, short is good. I am the queen of talking long, I know this. Um, I know also that I can break things up within Camtasia and I've started to do that a little bit more than I used to. Uh, thinking in small pieces, like Matt's little sample of a couple of minutes is about five minutes is really about right. I, if you wanna do longer content, link it. And we'll talk about ways that you can do that uh, as I talk a little bit more about some of the tricks and tips in Camtasia. I also give myself editing space. What does that mean? It means I do that. I pause for a moment. And that gives me some blank space that I know if I want to transition, for example, between announcements and content in an online class, that I've got that blank space there that allows me to make a clean cut. Okay. I don't cut my video so much anymore. I tend to uh, select areas to produce and then produce them individually. And I'll show you how I did that during the, the pandemic uh, second half of the semester and how I'm going to start doing that a little bit more when I uh, move into actually creating online content. My classes are big. I have 100 students in this class uh, and I don't expect all of them to come. Uh, what happened last time was that probably 20 of them came on a regular basis, and those were sort of my core kids, and that worked out pretty well. But as long as I am able to address people on the screen, um, that's important. Now, another thing that I do is I use a different slide ratio. Matt's slide ratio was widescreen, was 16 to 9. OK, I use the smaller four to three because I like the idea of having an ability not to, to have the pictures up and of my students up who are there. I, right now I see myself. I see Heather. I see Matt. I see Liz. I see Melinda. I see Deanna. And that's nice. I can see their faces and I can see if Heather's going, oh, God, you know, shut up and move along. And I can't. And I but I want you to be able to see all the material I've got there. So the difference here is if you look at the top uh, video here. It's in the widescreen. This is a little um, graduation video I did for our students when, who couldn't have graduation. It's widescreen, right? You can see that on the top video there, or the top uh, screenshot there, it moves the entire place. At the bottom, you can see that Heather and I are at the top there, and my and I keep a call out there, and the screen and the uh, slide is smaller. Uh, I have long liked this idea because it gives me more real estate on my screen to be able to see participants. And one of the things I want to do is encourage people to come and encourage people to use their videos so I can see if they're rolling their eyes or um, nodding, thank you, Matt, nodding their heads or saying, move along, Janelle, we're bored. All right. So uh, I suggest uh, four to three, the four to three ratio uh, over the 16 to nine, but your mileage may vary. All right, so Camtasia work area. 
Here's Heather's adorable smiling face. Uh, this is a screenshot from one of our, from the early part of our, our discussions. So I wanna show you the kinds of the areas in Camtasia. And again, they're very similar to the ones in Rush. You've got a media bin here, okay? And the media bin is what's gonna hold your content for the particular project you're working on. In this case, I have the sample MP4 video that Heather and I did. I've got a couple of audio shots. I can bring in pictures and other things if I want to. That's the kind of the folder for all the stuff that is in the particular project. You can have a library of other content as well, but that's just for the project itself. The canvas is where you actually have the work product. That's what you see what you're recording here, all right? So you can drag and drop stuff onto the canvas. You can drag and drop it into the timeline. Okay, and the timeline and tracks are what's below. Okay, so the timeline here, I've got a car horn in there because I was thinking I might show you how to bleep something out if you want to, but I probably would just delete it because um, I did a cussy because I cuss a lot. Uh, I happened to cuss with Heather and I was like, oh, oops, oh, I guess I can cut that out. I'll show you how to delete and uh, some of the important things about understanding how deletion works. The playhead is the little doodad on the bottom there that shows you where you are in the playing, as well as gives you the opportunity to, uh, by using those little handles on the side, to drag it forward and backward to, to do selections. And that's how I produce things, so I can keep my raw files pretty much sacred. Okay. The properties area allows me to adjust particular elements, like if I want to put a quiz in, that's where in the properties area is where I will edit my quiz questions or add my hot links or add my call outs. We'll talk about what some of those are in a little bit. And then two keystrokes that I think are really important for hotkeys are a place marker because markers are your friend. They let you determine where you are and you can label them. So I will sometimes label my announcements in a particular area. You can set actually bookmarks in your recording, although I tend not to do that because they tend to be kind of short. Shift M on both platforms lets you place a marker and you can change the markers uh, name in the properties uh, window. And ripple delete will actually delete the content and close it up, okay? If you simply use delete, it takes out whatever track you're on, but leaves the other tracks, all right? Or leaves the other content, leaves a gap in there, okay? Ripple delete closes up your gap. It is control backspace on a PC, command shift X on a Mac. Okay, so those are the two that I tend to use for keystrokes uh, in most often. And it has changed a lot since I started using this. Uh, you couldn't do a lot of this stuff back in 2008. So I am still catching up on my learning curve, because I think the last time I actually edited strongly on Camtasia was 2014, when I was teaching online classes pretty regularly. So importing, again, you use again the media bin, as I said, that holds all your current materials. The library will hold your commonly used contents, like if you want to uh, have a library of, of sounds like a, an intro and an outro, going in, going out, um, you can do that. You can keep uh, particular images and the like uh, in your library and you can pull those up quickly. And then you drag and drop content to your canvas for your timeline. And that's where you, you muck with it. So importing is not very hard and it's very similar to what Matt did in, uh, in VoiceThread. You just pull that stuff in using a plus sign or dragging and dropping it or, or what have you. I tend to use the, uh, the imports button, but you can drag and drop as well. Editing is where uh, Camtasia really is king. Uh, and again, Rush also has some of these similar kinds of, of tools. You can remove unwanted material. You can uh, edit out your uh, content at the beginning. Like I'll start, what I used to, was doing in the morning is I would start my video, check everything out, and it would have me in my pajamas half asleep because I teach a 9 a.m. class. And I'd be like, Ugh. but I wanted to be sure my recording was going. And then, since I was recording the entire time, I would pause it and then bring it back on. And when I was doing the editing, I could completely delete out all that unwanted, bleary-eyed pajama stuff and just start it there for my, for my uh, recordings of the, um, excuse me, recordings of the co course content. Again, I tend to leave my video files pretty sacred. I just save various versions of it. And you want to save uh, Camtasia projects before you actually render and, and publish them. Okay, so the delete again will delete and leave a hole. The ripple delete crunches stuff together and leaves a, um, 
a seamless deletion. So I tend to use ripple delete more than I use delete, although there are certainly times for both. Adding, however, you can add quizzes, and I'll show you how to do that. You can add callouts, which are little blocks that have information on them that can be corrections on what you uh, put in. So if you don't want to re-record something, you just want to post a correction or you're like, oh, I can't think of that right now, I'll get back to you. You can get back to them by putting a call out in that has that information. I know, for example, one of my earlier uh, lectures, not, and I couldn't do, you couldn't do this back in the earliest versions of Camtasia. I said a uh, uh, case is uh, Chaplinsky versus New Hampshire, and I said New York. And I, then I said, oops, oops, oops. And what I would have done then is just gone in and stuck a call out and it said, oops, I made it a boo-boo. Okay. Hotspots, okay, allow you to uh, put in a, an area to click for uh, an outside video or an outside website. There are uh, different things that you can do uh, with hotspots that allow you to bring in additional content. I tend to be pretty anal about watching copyright because I teach it. So I tend not to embed things. I tend to use call out so that you go actually to YouTube or to whatever site there is so that uh, you don't, you're not necessarily uh, grabbing their content and putting it in your own stuff. And finally, you can do closed captioning, uh, although your mileage may vary if you don't train your voice recognition very well. If, you if I look at mine now, it's a disaster. I have to go in and re-edit it. So I tend, if, what I'm going to start doing is using scripts a little bit more for my more formal work, and I'll have to train my closed captioning a little bit better for the voice, the voice recognition stuff. All right, so let's talk briefly about the playhead. The playhead is where is how you will negotiate that timeline. When you drag that video in, it will populate into from your canvas into that timeline. And the top track is your audio, right? That shows your audio level. And then the bottom is going to be your, your video here, all right? You can split that. So you can split the timeline in various ways. You can use the different handles to drag forward and backward. All right, you scrub, it's called scrubbing. You move through your video timeline using that line, that gray box. If you click right on the gray box and I'll show you, it moves the whole playhead, all right? You can zoom in using a plus and minus to get really close, to get within seconds or fractions of seconds. And you use the green, and green handles to drag that playhead to select the content, okay? So the gray line shows you exactly where you're at. If you drag the green handle, it'll go to the left and drag material before and select material before, and the red handle color selects it afterwards. Okay. Now, once you've done all that editing, and again, I will go in, I don't want to bounce back and forth necessarily. Once you've got that, uh, your editing uh, down to the point where you want, where you've added your callouts and your quizzes and your intros, outros, etc., you want to produce the thing. Okay. Producing isn't the same as publishing, although they can be really close together. Producing is actually creating the MP4 or the HTML uh, for the screen that you want to actually publish to the kids or to your audience. I always save things as a Camtasia project first. I will sometimes save various Camtasia projects. I save those to my hard drive uh, or to you know my external drive or to Dropbox. Uh, and then I can go in and always have kind of that raw file. I'm really anal about keeping raw finals, files. I really want to hold on to that raw material so that if I make a mistake, I can at least go back and recreate. You can set up templates. I'll show you. I don't usually, I haven't, done, I didn't do this last semester because I just recognized it was there as I was working on stuff for this semester. But I, I did make notes on how to be consistent so that everything is, is fairly similar when it comes to my call outs and my uh, links and all that stuff. Uh, I shift up a few, I changed up a few things, but I, I believe that consistency is going to be key going forward. And again, using markers can set off part of a project. And I also set off the parts of the project using markers and produce that particular part of the pro production. So for example, when I was teaching synchronously, I had a set of announcements. I gave myself a couple of beats. And then I started with the content. And that gave myself some blank space so that I knew that I was going to set the content before as the announcement, render that, publish it, and then the content of the class, edit that, add the hotspots, add whatever, render that, and publish it. Okay. And publishing, again, can be through a website, an HTML site. Um, Camtasia will generate HTML so that if you want to put it up on a website, uh, you can do that. I'll show you what mine looks like when I get to that point. 
Uh, I have tended to use for some of these, though, simply dumping the MP4s, whether they are edited or not, into Dropbox and linking through Dropbox. Now, you need a big Dropbox folder for this. I, and I, you may be able to do it through iCloud. You probably can. Uh, you can probably do it through Google. You can use the same idea through Google. You're getting links. But I have used Dropbox to great effect. And that is, uh, has been useful because I can just dump stuff into the folder in Dropbox and I don't have to worry about uploading tons of stuff onto Blackboard, which saves the, the time in the upload. You save it once and you don't have to re-upload it. Okay. So. I'll come back. To, I'm just going to say there's a, a resource thing. We'll talk a little bit about that. I, on the handout, I've got some links on where you can get. I noticed that Matt had used an Unsplash photo. That's one of the places that I use for, for free content attribute. You can attribute it, but you don't even have to do that. I've got some other options too, but please respect the creator's copyrights. Um, if stuff is not in the public domain or not Creative Commons attributed or Creative Commons attribution licensed, uh, you might want to try to get permission uh, and simply saying that this is where it's from doesn't necessarily protect you. I'm not going to give you a whole law lecture now, but uh, bottom line is just be careful when you copyright stuff or when you use stuff that it's not copyrighted. So I'm going to stop sharing this screen and I'm going to share Camtasia itself. Okay. And Sentinel tells me I'm up. This is a uh, uh, project that I started working on with the uh, teaching session I did with Heather. And I have added some things in so I can show you what they look like and show you the basics. I'm not going to turn my sound on. I don't want to uh, dump you or to get you with all of our with stuff like that. So I just want to simply show you why some of the stuff is, where some of the stuff is. Okay. Down below, you can see where the tracks are. Okay. Now, here's the playhead, and as I move the playhead, it's going to scrub through the material. Now, it's not going to change very much because I only have the one slide, but at the beginning here, you can see where I was sort of doing some slide changings, okay? That's scrubbing around, okay? Now, say I wanted to produce from this point here to a point before, okay? I would set it here where I want it to end. And my computer is being kind of fussy because I'm really overtaxing it. Do you see how that is tracking in blue there? That is the selected content, okay? And I've selected what, five seconds here, not even, of material. So I'm gonna select to the beginning here, okay? If I wanna produce this, I can simply if I'm using my PC here, I can right click here and I can produce timeline selection, okay? And that permits me then to set up a selection or a wizard that provides me the opportunity to produce this particular selection. I'm gonna not produce it because it'll take a little bit of time, but I'm gonna show you how it works, okay? I want it as an MP4 because I really like it as a, and I want it as a smart player which means that it'll have those controls and it will produce website HTML that I can use to put onto my website itself, okay? I uh, have the controller uh, setups. You can have thumbnails. You can change the size. You can change video and other settings, okay? Here, you want to change the HTML itself to, it'll say something like produced with Camtasia 2020. And I want to change it to something that'll show on my top bar. And I'll show you again what that looks like in um, when I take it to uh, my website. And I'll show you that HTML title because I think it's important to show that HTML title uh, to have it not be created by Camtasia, okay? Assuming I'm happy with all of this stuff, I can go to next. You can include a watermark if you want to. You can add um, copyright information, which I don't bother with. And when I go to next, okay, I have the opportunity then to have my quiz reported because I've got a quiz uh, in here somewhere in here. Uh, how I uh, receive the quiz information. So if I want to put my, you know, my email in there, I can. All right, whoops, I didn't put a valid email address in. I guess I'll do that. Okay. 
and then I produce it. Now, when I produce, if I were to hit finish, then it would go into the rendering, and I don't want to do that. Okay, it's saving right now, as you see. I have it saved on my own home, my own computer, because I want to be able to manipulate it later on using my uh, Dreamweaver or some sort of other HTML program. Okay, so that is how you essentially how you produce a video. Okay, now if I want to put a quiz in here, I'm going to unselect this here. Go back. I want to go to the quiz area here. I'm going to clear my. Select here. How do you add a quiz? All right, say I want to add a quiz. Under interactivity and under the Mac, it may be a little different. I can add a quiz to the timeline. Whoops, it's that right at the quiz right now. So I'm going to move my timeline here a little bit so I can add a different one. Then when I select the quiz placeholder here, all right, I have to hide my screen here. I want to be able to edit my quiz. And there I can add different questions here to my quiz. So say I want to say, you know, who is Jeff Ferson? All right. My default answer text. Third president. My, uh, and then it'll, you can note what the correct answer is by that. Uh, just some guy or chief justice. Okay. That's how it works. And now I have added it. I can have it be longer or shorter depending on a duration. We'll talk about that in, in a sec. And you can have the students take that. Now, if I want to preview it, come back here. If I want to test it, or I'm sorry. All right, you can do a feedback thing just like you can on Blackboard. And there is a way to test it. I, I've never done this here, but um, you can actually test what it looks like and it'll just pop up a screen that gives you that option there. Okay, and I will save this and send it to you guys and you can play around with it in Camtasia if you want to. Okay, now the way in which, and I'm watching my time here a little bit, the way in which you uh, negotiate the timeline is important. Okay, this little drag, those little drag boxes allow you to control how long something stays on the screen. Okay, so this, if I want to create a call out, now a call out here is a, um, is a area on the screen that gives you per particular information. So I'm going to add this call out here. I, I have this in my favorites, but you can add it through uh, visual effects also. Okay, or um, annotation, sorry, also. Okay, I want to put it here. I happen to have a, a particular gallery of, of changed uh, colors. I'm not gonna worry about that now. You can change the colors uh, and the like here. So say I wanna make it a speech bubble instead, or uh, I can change the, you know, the color. If I wanna use my, um, my setups, I can do that. Here's where I would make my corrections. Now say I don't, if I have it really short here, all right, and I'm gonna play this, it shouldn't have any music on it or anything. Um, you can see, it doesn't stay for very long. So when I wanna keep it to go longer, I want to drag it in the timeline to have it be st last longer. And it will last for as long as you ask it to in the timeline. And you can do this by dragging and, and uh, using the plus and minus to get in really close. Like you can see, as I've done here, you can get into fractions of a second, all right? And to zoom back out, use the minus. 
trying to think of what else. Closed captioning. Okay, I'm going to tell you really quickly about closed captioning. And again, this is just an introduction. You can have it uh, uh, render your own captions through speech to text. I've done some training and some adding of words. Okay, and it will. If I go continue, it will start to render. I'll start doing that to show you what it looks like. I'm not going to have it do it because it's creating the whole audio thing here, and then it'll go through, and it takes a long time because this is a 15 minute chat. Okay, it's not very good because I have not trained it very well yet. I plan to do some more training in it. You can do that directly through Camtasia. You can also do it through Windows if you're using Windows and through Mac, through various voice training, voice recognition training packages. All right, I'm trying to think if there's anything else to tell you. I'm gonna send you, show you one other thing of how I exported this. So I'm gonna stop sharing the Camtasia screen and go back to sharing my own screen which is my website for my class, which is called freespeechrocks.com. That is my spring 2020 recordings. And you can see how I split them out. So I have the announcements on the right side. And if you render through Camtasia, it will give you a package that looks, that has uh, MP4s, MP3s, and HTML that I can use directly through Dreamweaver. So I've set this basic up in Dreamweaver. I just dump the pages in. And if you click any one of these, you can see what they look like. I'm not going to do it here because I don't want to uh, clog up my poor screaming computer anymore. But you can go in and take a peek at it yourself. Okay. Now, I hope I haven't confused. This not as straightforward, not as easy as... Um, as uh, VoiceThread is. As you can see, there's a, a bigger learning curve here. But I do want to go uh, see if there's anything else to tell you here. I think I hit there's a, most of the big ones. There is a WordPress plugin, but it's a paid one. Uh, I don't know if there are other ways to, to do it. I have found very good success in using the uh, Free Speech Rock site or uh, putting links into Dropbox or from Dropbox into Blackboard. And again, it's not a short learning curve, but there's a lot you can do. Uh, and it is mostly information out with the exception of quizzes uh, and not as much interactive like VoiceThread is. So I think there are possibilities to do uh, a number of different things using different applications. Okay, so I'm gonna go back quickly to sharing my screen here. I don't think I have that much more on Camtasia, my PowerPoint here. I think I don't actually, I think that's the last slide. I am on Twitter at in underscore Fieri and at KU. And I'm gonna stop sharing. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Janelle, for all of those um, fabulous hints. Um, so a couple of questions we had here for you. So first of all, law comments. This is wonderful. Oh my gosh, all the things. Yeah, uh, it, and it's. I apologize for not. Tr I was trying to give you an overview, and it turned out to be a lot more in detail than I'd hoped. But if I were doing this on Camtasia, I would simply go and edit myself out. But I ain't. So it's fine. Um, so we also had a lot of people who thought it was great tips on the four to three screen. So that was pretty popular. Just the idea of doing that four four to three orientation was exciting to people. Um, so there was, there were some questions about, well, it looks like, it sounds like there's a lot of different things I could use. Um, so looking at Premiere or Rush or Kaltura or Camtasia, um, and I don't know if you want me or you to kind of speak about those differences or talk about that workflow. Go ahead. I um I don't use Kaltura. I only putz with Rush. I've been using Camtasia, like I said, since I don't know, 2008, so I at least know where everything is on it. So I would welcome welcome your comments on it. Okay. So my my theory on, you know, like which is best um, is, is really about what you, kind of your end purpose is. And I really use all of them. So for example, and I know all of these, so that does make a difference. Um, I use Camtasia when I want to have 
um, those quick markers that Janelle mentioned, if you upload directly to YouTube, those export as time markers into YouTube. Um, so to me, that's a, a great work feature. I do a lot of training videos. So that's really the, um, that's kind of an important feature for Let me. Let me show you one other thing too quick. The same thing is share. You can share directly from the corner button up here and that has a YouTube option. So I don't usually use the markers that way, but I can absolutely see how those would work. Yeah. So if you have a lot of different content, that's pretty handy. Um, I think things like Kaltura for me, that's quick down and dirty editing. I don't need to do a lot of post-production work. I'm kind of cruising out. Um, and so that's when I would use those type of things. I use things like uh, Premiere and Rush when I need to do a little more um, audio editing. So like my, my long standing mic just died on me. So I've been in a, um, having to do a lot more audio posts. So that's kind of what, but really Camtasia gives you these kind of extra features that you may not get in some of the other things. Um, another question was, can you save this out to media hub? And I'm not sure I'm aware of what media hub, I think it's one of the free things I'm get, suspecting you can. Yeah, um, I think this is you can save. In fact, you can save. So once you get the file saved to your, I don't know that there's an actual, um, like an upload thing to you. I saw Vimeo. I don't use any of the other ones here. I'm going to quick flash into this without sharing it just because I think it's, um, you can go to a local file, screencast.com, Nomia. I've never heard of that. Uh, TechSmith Video Review, Vimeo, YouTube, Google Drive, or a custom production, which suggests to me that you can add in whatever you'd like, including a media, my guess is including that media hub, although I've never used it myself. I, I, I don't even use YouTube because, again, I'm sort of a control freak. I want the material where I want it, and I don't want students to have to listen through advertisements if something's a little longer. Um, but that's just me. It's not, if you don't know HTML, and I don't know enough HTML, I know that we'll have an HTML session. I think Jerry is one of the folks teaching it, and I know she's here. Um, and I know enough HTML to get by. Um, you know, I generate my website in Dreamweaver and basically dump in those HTML files wholesale. And uh, Camtasia does a really nice job of dumping out a nice looking site with all the controls on it. Yeah. And so just to kind of share with, are there, well, first of all, are there any other questions for either Matt or Janelle today? Okay, well, if, there's, if you do have one, feel free to jump in. Um, I'll stick around a few minutes too, if anybody wants to chat, yeah. if that's okay with Heather. That's perfect. Um, just to wrap up, first of all, thank you guys so much for coming and attending and uh, spending part of your, your lunch break with us today. Just to give you an overview, so Janelle mentioned some presentation tips. Our session tomorrow from 11 to one really focuses in on presentation. So if you're like, I don't know what you're talking about with different lighting. I don't know what you're talking about with eyes at the, come into that session. We're going to be talking all about those like technical parts of audio and lighting and video. Um, we have a journalism professor who's going to give you some great tips for your presence in Zoom. Um, and we're going to also talk about how you can chunk content and use some of the advanced Blackboard features like whiteboard and breakout rooms and all, all things Zoom tomorrow. And then next Monday, which Janelle just alluded to, we're going to have a big group of professors um, doing what we call Blackboard and Beyond. So we're going to show you best practices in Blackboard and then go beyond that to how you can connect with your students when you're in an online environment. And Janelle, um, mentioned Jerry B. Jerry is one of our professors who's going to talk about some really, I, I got a sneak preview of her presentation today. And it's a lot of cool, free, multi-use tools, way to get students engaged in an online environment, um, which I think that's a special gift. So if you haven't signed up for those, I encourage you to sign up for those because those are kind of a big full thing. We've just got a question come in. Um, okay, so, Calturvers, 
Kaltura, what about Kaltura Zoom and VoiceThread? Is that with VoiceThread, students can communicate back within each slide? Uh, yes. So that's really the advantage of VoiceThread is that students can come back, um, they can hear each other's comments, there's more of that dialogue back and forth. So when Janelle was talking about Camtasia just goes out, that's really what it is. So think of something like your Camtasia or if you're using um, just recording your Zoom lectures, that's, that might just be like content going out. Um, but using these, these, these things like VoiceThread allows some interaction from your students. And we're gonna be talking again tomorrow and Monday more about that interaction. So hopefully that answered that question. Anything else? Okay, well, again, thank you guys so much for coming. We will hang out here for a couple of minutes. Um, as things wrap up, if you have questions, feel free to ask our speakers directly. They'd be happy to help you. Thank you so much for coming. We're getting a lot of thank yous as everyone leaves. So a lot of this was great. This was fabulous. Um, Matt, we have a request yeah. for you to demonstrate one more time how to share and delete on VoiceThread. Oh. Would you be able to do that for us? Yeah, let me just go back to share screen. And let's see, I think this is it. Thank you. And Matt, while you're pulling that up, I have yeah. some very old videos that were shared with me that I see the place to delete, but it says they're not able to be deleted. So I didn't know. Oh, that's weird. I have not yeah. heard of that one. Um, okay. the, uh, I'm just back here. You can see this is my homepage. This is the one that I, I demoed. Uh, and then this was just the, the raw slides that I brought up. Um, yeah, so you'll notice I, I, this is where you share to go out and, and generate that link. Um, delete is pretty simple. That's just the trash can. Yeah. And so I have <laughs> so like that, 25 files that have no trash can. So I guess they just have to stay. Wow. There. Okay. I've okay. not seen that. I'm wondering if it could be maybe from an older version of voice. It perhaps? is. It's from when we okay. first got it several years ago. Would you mind going back to the, the share thing then? So you click on that arrow. Yeah. You click on this to share and then it's going to bring up a, come on, there it is. It's gonna bring up some options for you. Uh, I use the basic option, which is just to generate a copy of link, right? So okay. it's gonna give me a link there. And then just make sure you've got view and comment on to allow the students to view and comment. And, and then, then you can literally just like copy that and then you could put it like yep. in a blackboard folder or email it out. Okay. Yep, I, I put it on, uh, usually what I'll do is in my announcements on Blackboard, I'll say, hey guys, that that pre-lecture, that pre-content I was gonna pre-record, in fact, I even call it a pre-record. The pre-record is up for this week, here's the link. Wonderful. Thank you both. This is a wonderful session. I appreciate your time and I know how busy everybody is. So thanks for making this opportunity. Yeah, you're no, welcome for coming. Awesome. Bye. Okay. Yeah, a lot of really good comments in the, the chat. Like people are very much like, it's not only this is great, it's this was great, all caps, exclamation points, multiple exclamation points. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, Thank you guys both, because that's a big ask to do. Like Janelle said, it's a big app for, you know, I ask you guys to share in 15 to 20 minutes. <laughs> well, I felt, I, as I'm going through it, I'm thinking, God, if I was watching this, I would want to edit myself down some, but I wanted to show everything that you could do, at least give people yeah. a taste of it. And I'll send my slides on and. Yeah. And I think, I think this is great because we showed two up. We showed kind of a, a simpler uh, option for mm -hmm. those that, you know, that may have not done much video work, but your option gives them a lot more capability. Well, and I, you know, I didn't know you could do quite as much with VoiceThread as you can. Um, yeah, but the editing is very rudimentary though. So yeah, you, you're able to do a lot more editing. And, yeah. And it, but it is a higher learning curve. You know, if I hadn't been using this forever, I'm not sure I could have used it <laughs> for as well, much as I, I think I told someone in the chat because they were, there was a lot of questions about like, well, which one do you really recommend? And it's kind of pick your own adventure. You know, if if Camtasia is like, I've never edited video in my life. They're going to be a lot like the students I teach, which is what? But maybe VoiceThread is a great place to start. 
And then, you know, I get the training wheels, then I get the training wheels off the bike. And, you know, like, well, and, you know, I am not a video editor either. I just make it up. I mean, I, I'm a media law person. Uh, this is not my, I, I enjoy doing it largely because I think it's uh, good for the kids, but I am no, I mean, I'm no video editor. I mean, you're the, you're the goddess, Heather. I am not. I, I just putz. To, to some degree, like if, I, if I'm doing like six PowerPoint slides and I just need my voice over it, going into Camtasia is a little bit like driving the Lamborghini down to the mailbox. Yeah. Like I, I don't necessarily need to do that. Um, so I, you know, I think it's, I like that we presented two different options. And I think that like you, you both alluded to our second and third sessions for this series that add some more stuff. So, well, I think one of the big things about that I have found useful was the export from Camtasia out to an MP M- HTML mm-hmm. without me having to know much HTML. Um, right. and that to me, then I can dump that up and I can use free speech rocks and people can just jump and grab when they want to that. And I don't like, because I, I understand blackboard, you know, necessity, but if my kids want to jump in and just watch a video, they shouldn't have to go through all that authentication and all that stuff. So, mm-hmm. yeah. I mean, I, I, and I, what I didn't mention, what I probably should have is that I might, if I start, keep doing this, I, I will probably do a release saying, you know, if you really have trouble with you, your face being on, tell me and I'll edit you out or, you know, do a video release kind of thing. But, you know, I think about, um, I think about, you know, um, liability stuff sometimes too. That's why I talked about the copyright and put those resources down. Cause, and I was pleased that you used the Unsplash thing. I've actually got an account on Unsplash. I've got a few pictures up there myself. I love it. it. Heather, I need to shove to another meeting, but. um, Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you guys very much. You bet. Yeah.